today, we'll be looking to assess the current state of every single Capcom franchise. While not nearly as prolific as companies such as a Nintendo or Sony, Capcom has still managed to produce a significant number of franchises, 47 to be exact from my knowledge, including spin-off series. Now, as I did with Nintendo, I've set out certain criteria to help make sure I'm still alive to post this video. For one, only franchises that include more than one mainline game in the series will be included. This time around though, I will be including Japanese exclusive franchises as there aren't actually that many to begin with. Each franchise will be placed into one of six tiers, which is a term I use loosely, starting with the big boys, also known as the flagships. Next are the mainstays, which are, well, main franchises that have stayed around consistently throughout the years. It exists as a tier for franchises that release every now and then to remind us that they're still alive. Life support franchises are ones that haven't seen a new entry in a while and are on their last legs begging for a revival. Zombie franchises are franchises that have technically already died, but they still have the potential for a revival. And then we have dead franchises that passed away with the dinosaurs and will most likely never return. Spin-off series will be discussed separately and also placed in their own list throughout the video. And also, an important disclaimer, all the placements in this list are my own choices. You're free to disagree, and this is in no way a tier list, judging franchises based on how good and bad they are. And with all of that out of the way, let's delve in and find out once and for all the current state of every Capcom franchise. Capcom would start its journey with the release of a coin-operated arcade machine called Little League in July of 1983. They would follow up with another one in October called Fever Chance. Now while these aren't technically a franchise, I thought it best to mention them as they would mark the beginning of what would one day become one of the biggest Japan-based video game companies in the world. After dipping its toes into the arcade market, Capcom would release its first real arcade game, Volgus, in 1984. Volgus had the player take control of a spaceship as it cruised across an alien planet. The spaceship was equipped with a simple blaster and also had a limited supply of missiles that could be replenished with the power icons. A sequel called Titan Warriors was actually developed for the NES, but unfortunately was never released. Well, at least that's what Capcom believed, because a playable finished ROM was actually made available online since its cancellation. Safe to say, this franchise has no consistency, and while it was one of the more popular arcade games of its time, sales as a whole remain fairly low. The games have actually had representation in future games however, such as the power icon being reused in future Capcom games, a boss being named after the initial game, as well as the mention of Volgus 2 from Deadpool in a future fighting game. All in all, while it got the ball rolling for Capcom, it's safe to say that this franchise is dead, if you can even call it a franchise. Just 6 months after the release of Volgus, Capcom would release another arcade game, this time going by 1942. The game was a vertically scrolling shoot 'em up game, based on the events of World War II. The player was tasked with reaching Tokyo and destroying the Japanese air fleet. Wait, what? What? The reason this odd approach was taken was Capcom had started targeting a more global Western audience. This approach would certainly pay off as the game became a commercial success ranking within Japan's five highest grossing table arcade games of 1986. It would then be ported over to the NES where it would go on to sell over 1 million copies worldwide. As a result, a further 8 games would release under the 194X name, starting with 1943, The Battle of Midway, ending with 1942, First Strike, and 2010. While once a consistent franchise, there hasn't been a new entry in over a decade. The franchise as a whole has sold over 1.4 million units, and while that may not seem like a lot these days, that was extremely impressive back then. Unfortunately, due to the lack of new games and a lack of further representation outside of a few re-releases on newer consoles such as the Wii Virtual Console, the franchise at this stage is most likely dead. Capcom would continue its streak of successful arcade franchises with the release of Commando in 1985. Commando would adopt a vertically scrolling format, but instead of a plane, the player took control of a military soldier named Super Joe. Equipped with an assault rifle and a limited handful of grenades, Joe was tasked with fending off a massive assault of enemies while the screen panned upwards. The game was a commercial success, at one point becoming the world's top arcade game after ending the 1985 year as the highest grossing arcade game. In a similar fashion to 1942, the game would be ported over to the NES where it would once again sell over 1 million copies worldwide. At this point, I'm sure people were calling it the NES effect. Once called the great granddaddy of the modern shoot'em up genre, the game would be highly influential in popularizing the run and gun shooter style. The game would spawn two sequels in the form of Mercs released in 1989 and Wolf of the Battlefield Commando 3, which was released as a downloadable title in 2008. Due to the lack of consistency and other meaningful additions to the franchise, 
I believe it's now a dead franchise though. Capcom had proven with these last two franchises that they were here to stay. The question was, could Capcom make it a hat trick? Well, not only did they strike gold once again, this next franchise went far beyond anything the previous two franchises had ever done. Released in 1985 for arcades, Ghosts and Goblins was a running gun platformer that had players con take control of a knight named Sir Arthur. Princess Prinprin had been kidnapped by Astaroth, and it's up to Sir Arthur to rescue her while defeating zombies, giants, demons, and whatever the fuck this thing is. Along his journey, the player could pick up new weapons, bonuses, and even extra suits of armor. The game is infamous for its extremely hard difficulty, which personally I never really understood, and to me it just sounds like something bad players Ah, uh, sorry guys, I slipped up there. But like I was saying, if you were even decently good at- Huh. That's weird. I think the game's kind of bugging out a bit. Regardless- Okay, yeah, this game's fucking hard. Two hits. That's all you get before losing a life. And if you lost a life, you'd have to start the level from the beginning, or at the halfway point if you had reached it. Not only this, but the sick bastards behind the game also made it so that once you had beaten the final boss, you'd have to then replay the whole game on an even harder difficulty, just to achieve the true final ending. The game united massacres across the world, as it became one of the best-selling arcade games of its time. It was also, and you know the drill by now, ported over to the NES, among other consoles, where it would sell over 1.6 million copies worldwide. The game was so popular that it not only resulted in four mainline sequels, a puzzle game, a gambling game, and two mobile games, but it also spawned two separate spin-off series that each had multiple games of their own. The first of these spin-off series was Gargoyle's Quest, released in 1990 for the Game Boy, an action-adventure platform game that flipped the narrative as it had you play as Firebrand, a crowd favorite antagonist character from the original Ghost and Goblin series. The game would accommodate two styles of gameplay, an overhead view when traveling around the world as well as the 2D action platformer levels. Firebrand could jump, cling to walls, hover for a short while, and fire projectiles. One sequel and one prequel would be developed for the series. Gargoyle's Quest 2 for the NES in 1992, and Demon's Crest for the SNES in 1994. Now I wonder if you guys know which was which. Despite being praised for its detailed graphics and novel scrolling camera, the series would not release another game following Demon's Crest. The games would, however, release on the Switch Online service earlier this year. Over a decade later, the second spin-off series, Maximo, would release for the PlayStation 2 in 2001. Originally planned for the N64, the game was an attempt to merge Ghost and Goblins universe with illustrator Suzumu Matsushita's manga artwork, but unfortunately was delayed before being transferred to the PS2. The game begins with Maximo returning to his castle, only to get one hit by his own advisor, Akili. Realizing that if he were to die, the game would be very short, Maximo instead strikes a deal with death himself and is brought back to life with the goal of stopping Achilles' evil plan. The gameplay involves players hacking and slashing their way through countless enemies. As was the case in the Ghost series, Maximo would also wear armor that would slowly break as he incurred more hits from enemies. Unlike the Ghost series, players were able to pay the Grim Reaper death coins in order to retry, with each death increasing the amount owed. Taking place over five major worlds, each world would consist of multiple stages and a boss battle. Upon defeating these bosses, players were given a few choices. You could get a health bonus, you could save the game, or you could receive a kiss from the rescued sorceress. Now I don't know about you guys, but one of these options is far superior to the rest. <coughs> The game would receive fairly favorable reviews and would make the PlayStation 2 greatest hits after selling more than 400,000 units in North America. Within two years, a sequel titled Maximo vs Army of Sin would release for the PlayStation 2 in 2003. Featuring many of the core aspects of the original, the game would receive favorable reviews but would only go on to sell about 200,000 units, a 50% drop from the first game. Following its release, Studio 8, the developers of Maximo, began working on a third game. Concept art as well as an early playable prototype were actually shown. However, the game would never get the green light from Capcom, and as a result, Maximo vs Army of Sin remains the series' latest entry. The two games would, however, be released on the PlayStation Network for the PS3 in 2011. Overall, the Ghost and Goblins franchise as well as its spin-off series have seen commercial success and have built their own dedicated fanbase. The main series would go on to get its own resurrection on the Switch in 2021, fittingly titled Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection. Along with this, Arthur, Firebrand, and the universe itself would make several cameos in other franchises, from Arthur's costumes in the Mega Man and Smash series, to playable characters in the X Capcom series and Versus Capcom series. All in all, I believe Ghosts and Goblins has potential to be a Capcom mainstay, or at least in the It Exists tier, while its two spin-off series are most likely either in the Dead or Zombie tier for now. 
Continuing on with their lucrative arcade series, Capcom would look to plagiarize their own franchise, but this time they would add the word Bionic in front of it. Released in Japan in 1987 as Top Secret, the game followed protagonist Nathan Rad Spencer as he was tasked with uncovering what happened to another super agent, whom you may remember as Super Joe. Now, this connection was purely created for Western audiences and was never the intent of the series creator Takuru Fujiwara. So while there may be discourse regarding whether they're a part of the same franchise or not, I chose to separate them as two unique series. The Bionic Commando games were platform games in which the player couldn't jump. Instead, players could use a bionic arm to swing across gaps and climb ledges. The game would be received well, going on to become the fifth most successful table arcade game of the month. Now I know what you're thinking, you know, let me guess, they ported this game over to the NES and it sold a billion copies. Well, you're partially right, but instead of just directly porting the game over, Capcom would have introduced some significant changes in the form of removing any and all references to Nazism that was present in the original Japanese version. As for the game's sales, well, there's no information I could find apart from the fact that Capcom employee Ben Jude said that the game did not sell well in Japan. This didn't mark the end of the Bionic Commando franchise, however, as multiple sequels would be released for the series in the form of Bionic Commando Elite Forces, which was released in 1999 for the Game Boy Color and acted as a sequel to the original 1987 arcade version of the game, as well as Bionic Commando, which was released in 2009 for the PS3, Xbox 360, and PC, as a sequel to the 1998 NES version. The NES version of the game would also receive a portable adaption for the Game Boy in 1992, as well as an enhanced remake titled Bionic Commando Rearmed, which was made available on PlayStation Network and Xbox Live in 2008. This was also a prelude to the 2009 version Bionic Commando. Rearmed would then get a sequel three years later in 2011 with Bionic Commando Rearmed 2. Confused yet? I mean, I certainly am as I write this. Hell, I'm not even sure if I've got this all right. But as of the current day, this is where the franchise stands. Rad Spencer would go on to make future appearances in games such as Marvel vs. Capcom, but as a whole, I believe this franchise is looking well towards life support. Now by this stage, Capcom had established itself as a somewhat considerable force within the gaming space. What they didn't realise at the time, however, was that their next franchise would not only continue the success, but shoot them straight to stardom. Street Fighter would make its first appearance in 1987 for arcades. The franchise became a breakout success, selling up to 1,000 cabinets. Wait, that's it? Well, in reality, the original punching pad cabinet was poorly received. It wasn't until the alternative six-button version was released that Street Fighter actually got some recognition. Playing as the iconic character Ryu, players would engage in one-on-one -on -one fights against a CPU or another player, who took control of Ryu's former partner and current rival, Ken. Using a best-of-three format, players could use the joysticks and buttons to move left and right, crouch, jump, and block. They would also have access to three punch and kick attacks. Three special attacks could also be used, the Hadouken, the Tatsumaki Senpaku, and the Shiryugen. The game would become Japan's fifth highest grossing arcade game in 1987, before taking the top spot in January of 1988. Despite this, the game wasn't considered a breakout success. It would, however, lead the groundwork for the game that would change everything. Following the commercial success of Final Fight, another fighting game franchise that we'll cover later in this video, Capcom would begin developing an interest in a Street Fighter sequel. Yoshiki Okamoto recounted at the time, the idea was to revive Street Fighter and to make it a better playing arcade game as a whole. Over the course of two years from 1989 to 1991, a team of 35 to 40 people including Noritaka Funamizu, Akira Nishitani and Akira Yasuda would work tirelessly on the game. The result? was a product that would shake the very foundations of the gaming industry. Street Fighter 2 would release on the 6th of February 1991 in arcades. The game would follow several conventions and rules established by its predecessor, such as the best of three one-on-one -on -one timed format, in which the winner was decided based on who had more health at the end. Street Fighter 2 heavily expanded on its predecessor though, becoming the first one-on-one -on -one fighting game to feature a whole cast of characters that players could freely choose from, each with their own specific movesets. Grappling moves and throws would also feature in this rendition with the addition of new special attacks. So it kind of hyped up Street Fighter 2 at the start. But the game wasn't actually that successful in Japan initially, mainly because players were actually going at it solo, which is something someone like me with no friends would do. It wasn't until Japan arcade magazine Gamest published some articles informing people like, hey, you know you can play this 
this game with other people, right? That the game would finally start gaining some traction. I say some traction, but in reality, it would bulldoze through everything without ever looking back. In the United States specifically, the game was immediately successful, exceeding all expectations set. It became the highest grossing arcade game of 1991, and by 1994, had already been played by over 25 million people in the United States alone. To this day, more than 200,000 arcade cabinets, as well as 15 million units have been sold, bringing the gross revenue of this one singular game to a staggering 10 billion plus and inspired grassroots tournament events that have culminated into the massively popular Evolution Championship series, also known as EVO. This monumental success has resulted in numerous mainline sequels in the form of Street Fighter 3 released in 1997, Street Fighter 4 released in 2008, and most recently Street Fighter 5, which was released in 2016. Street Fighter 6 is on the horizon as well, looking to be released in June of this year. But wait, that's not all. This series would go on to receive multiple sub-series as well, the first of which was the Street Fighter Alpha series, the series would feature only three titles between the years 1995 to 1998 and look to flesh out the backstory and grudges held by many of the classic Street Fighter 2 characters. A year later, Capcom would co-produce a 3D fighting game named Street Fighter EX with Arika, a company founded by Akira Nishitani, who had worked as a designer on the Street Fighter 2 games. The game would combine the classic Street Fighter roster with new faces from Akira, while featuring gameplay similar to Street Fighter 2 and the Street Fighter Alpha series. The series would see a further two games in the form of Street Fighter EX 2 in 1990. And finally, Street Fighter EX3 for the PS2 in the year 2000. Now, there are technically more sub-series, such as the Super Puzzle Fighter games, Super Gem Fighter Mini Mix, which got their own mobile spin-off series. And there are also countless crossover games, but I thought I'd leave them for now and come back to them as separate franchises. With all that said, we can finally place the Street Fighter fr- So wait, what? Are you serious? There's more? Well, we can't forget about all the other media, such as anime films, animated TV shows, manga and comics, live action films, and the- All right, we get it. Jesus Christ. Street Fighter has made a name for itself as Capcom's first flagship, and remains one to this day. As for its sub-series, I believe they're most likely in the zombie tier, as there's always a chance for revival when branding the Street Fighter name. At this point, there should be something glaringly obvious. Well, these franchises so far have been, well, produced by Capcom. Well, no shit. Now, all jokes aside, what is apparent though is that up until this point, Capcom had been developing games purely for arcades and not really home consoles. During the mid 1980s, Capcom looked to change this though and started working on a project specifically for home consoles. By the end of 1987, the game would release with the now iconic title. Mega Man. The first Mega Man game would release on the NES and follow the struggles of humanoid robot called, well, Mega Man. The player would take control of Mega Man and fight through six stages, all of which culminated in a boss battle against one of the six robot masters. The game was one of the first to introduce a non-linear path, allowing the player to choose the order in which they take on these stages. Part of the game's strategy was to pick out stages that would earn the players the most useful weapons that could be used in future stages. Critics praised Mega Man for its design and many of the core aspects that would go on to craft the subsequent games. Funnily enough, not even Capcom thought this game would sell, yeah, they thought it would flop, but after decent games in Japan, the team quickly commissioned an American localization. Now as part of this rush to localization, Capcom would have to get someone to draw the cover art in as little as 6 hours, and the West as a result was blessed with this masterpiece. Nice. Yeah, the game didn't sell well, but it was obviously good enough to start pumping out sequels as two years later, Mega Man 2 would release, and two years after that, Mega Man 3 would release. And from there, the classic Mega Man series would see a new game released pretty much every single year until 1996. Mega Man would then go on vacation for 12 years before returning in Mega Man 9, 10, and most recently, Mega Man 11, which was released in 2018 for all consoles. Now you may be thinking, well dang, you know, 12 years without a new game, the franchise almost died. Well, let me introduce you to the 50 billion sub-series and spin-offs that were released before, during, and after the classic Mega Man's vacation. We'll quickly run through each one so this video isn't longer than it already is. As the series moved from the NES to the SNES, Capcom looked to redesign the series both in terms of graphics and controls. What they created was X, the successor to Mega Man, who was more advanced and had complete free will over his thoughts and feelings. The games would feature a similar format to the original NES, with stages that offered different weapons upon defeating each boss. New additions included the ability to dash, scale walls, and even obtain armor attachments, creating access to special abilities. The game would perform well and spark the start of a new series that has seen eight total mainline games over the last 
past two decades, with various other spin-offs and legacy collections. The game's narrative has yet to conclude, with Mega Man X8 ending on a cliffhanger in 2004. Since then, multiple collections have been released, as well as the latest game in the subseries, Rockman X Dive, which was released in 2020 as a mobile game. While there hasn't been a new mainline entry since 2004, multiple legacy collections as well as the recent mobile game do enough to just barely keep it in the life support tier. Now after screwing around on Nintendo consoles for a bit, Mega Man would then make his way over to the PlayStation in 1997 with Mega Man Legends. Now in 3D, the game looked to take advantage of the console's hardware, shifting its gameplay from the usual side-scrolling platformer to an action-adventure game sandbox with RPG elements. The series unfortunately only has two mainline games and a spin-off. Mega Man Legends 3 was at one point in development before being cancelled in late 2011, with no plans to resume development. A campaign would actually start, known as Get Me Off The Moon, in which over 100,000 people pushed for the game's release. This would include sending letters, emails, and even calling Capcom's headquarters in order to get them to change their minds. Capcom has acknowledged this, but has stayed firm in their decision to this day. There is a small possibility it'll come back, so I believe it goes in the zombie tier. And while that's tragic to hear, it's not like Mega Man fans were starved for content, because let's have a look here. Oh yeah, we're only on sub-series 3 of 80 billion. So we've had 2D platformer games, 3D action adventure games with RPG elements, and I wonder what would happen if they were to expand on those RPG elements. Well, you'd get the Mega Man Battle Network games. These games were primarily developed for the Game Boy, amidst the success of Nintendo and Game Freak's Pokemon series. The series would have players take control of land, on the outside and megaman.exe within the net. While in control of LAN, players could explore the world map, check emails, purchase items, and even interact with NPCs. The combat, however, only ever took place within the net and featured a grid that was divided into two sides. On one side, you had megaman.exe. On the other side, you had, well, the enemies. The simple goal was to wipe out the enemies on the other side using Mega Man's signature arm cannon. The initial games were met with positive reviews and over the course of eight years would see six main games released ending with Mega Man Battle Network 6 as well as multiple spin-offs. The series was deemed by developers as complete following Battle Network 6 due to the new DS hardware and therefore we can put it into the finished category. Up until this point, none of these series had a real definitive conclusion, at least in terms of its story. That was about to change though in 2012 with the release of Mega Man Zero. Now Zero wasn't a completely original character, as he served as X's sidekick in the Mega Man X subseries. The gameplay for the series remained fairly similar to how Zero played in the X series, with an in-depth ranking system that actually rewarded players with new abilities and enhancements based on how well they performed. Legend has it that the saying get good actually originated during this era, because well, it actually held true to some extent. The series would also introduce the Cyber Elf system, which allowed Zero to equip the slaves, I mean small helpers being known as Cyber Elves. These would assist them in combat and provide permanent enhancements. The series was regarded as a return to form for the Mega Man franchise. It would go on to include a further three games until Mega Man Zero 4. With this fourth installment, Mega Man Zero would become the first series in the franchise to reach a definitive conclusion, meaning we can also place it in the finished tier. Now set 200 years after the events of the Zero series, we now arrive at Mega Man ZX, released in 2006 for the Nintendo DS. The player now had the choice between a male and female protagonist, a first for the franchise. The game took elements from both the X and Zero series and had players explore a 2D overlaid map as sprites before engaging enemies to finish their missions. These missions were selected from a list that was displayed on a computer, and players had the choice of exploring both the game world during and between missions. A sequel would release a year later in 2007 called Mega Man ZX Advent and would mark the last entry into the sub-series. A third entry codenamed Mega Man ZXZ would enter development during 2008 was later cancelled by Capcom. Because of this, it's hard to see the sub-series making a grand return. It would however be included in a legacy collection in 2020, and I'm not going to write off the potential new entry when it comes to the Mega Man name, so I'll put it in zombie tier for now. Now is there anyone even still with me? Well, if you are, you may be glad to hear that we've arrived at the final sub-series of this massive franchise. Acting as a follow-up to the Battle Network series and commemorating the 20th anniversary of the franchise as a whole, Mega Man Star Force would release for the Nintendo DS in 2006. Star Force would draw a lot of its gameplay elements from Battle Network, with players battling within a 3x5 grid and using battle cards to attack enemies. A total of three games would release for the series, ending with Star Force 3 in 2008, with people criticising it for its lack of innovation in regards to its similarities with the Battle Network games. As is the case with a lot of these sub-series, another sequel was actually put into development from 2009 to 2010, but due to the low sales of Star Force 3, this as well would end up being cancelled by Capcom. It seems at this point that Capcom has no plans to continue the series 
series. Overall, the franchise has amassed a total of 38 million units sold across all its games. Pair that with countless appearances in other media such as anime, TV, film adaptions and comics, and the franchise has easily become one of Capcom's biggest flagships. Get that shit out of here. You want to see a real ninja? Here. Okay, I swear he does cool stuff. Let me introduce you to Strata Hiryu, the protagonist of, well, Strata. Released in 1989 for arcades, the game was developed in conjunction with the manga studio Moto Kikaku. The game was a hack and slash platform game in which players controlled Strata as he ripped through his enemies. Strata was able to perform multiple aerial moves, including regular vertical jumps as well as cartwheel jumps. Additionally, he was able to climb across walls and ceilings and slide under certain objects. This style of gameplay was innovative for its time, and has been cited as a major influence for future franchises such as Ninja Gaiden and Devil May Cry. The franchise would see a further two sequels produced, Strider 2 and, uh, Strider 2? Wait a minute! Strider 2, which was known as Journey from Darkness Strider Returns in North America, would release in 1990. The game was published by US Gold under license from Capcom USA and is considered non-canon. The game would receive fairly poor reviews, with some describing it as seeing a loved one revived as a mindless zombie. Nine years later, Capcom themselves thought, fuck it, let's just make our own true sequel, also called Strider 2. Unfortunately, this game was too met with mixed reviews due to its short length and overall lack of innovation. The franchise would return in 2014 with a reboot of the original, which is where the series has been left to this day. Strider being the ninja he is, has managed to sneak his way into a few other franchises though, such as Capcom vs games and Mega Man Legends among others. Seeing as we haven't seen a new original game in over two decades though, I can only place the franchise in live support. The next banger Capcom would release out into the world was Final Fight, released in arcades in 1989. The game took the format of a side-scrolling beat-em-up, where the player had the choice between three playable characters, Mike, Cody, and Guy. The premise of the game revolved around fighting your way through different sections of Metro City in an attempt to rescue Mike's daughter and Cody's girlfriend, Jessica. The game allowed two players to play at once and offered a variety of moves, including standard punches, aerial kicks, and even grabbing and throwing enemies. Weapons and health recovery items could also be picked up off the ground and used. Each stage would end with a boss battle, which... I swear it seemed much harder when I was younger. Wow. The game would go on to receive major commercial success in arcades, selling over 30,000 arcade units, prompting the release of two further sequels, multiple spin-off games, as well as, you guessed it, a port to a home console, in this case the SNES. The port, while omitting Guy completely, as well as having no multiplayer access, would go on to sell 1.5 million cartridges, making it one of Capcom's best-selling games on the platform. Capcom would follow up on this by releasing both Final Fight 2 and 3 with each subsequent game, introducing new playable characters, chuck in a few spin-off games like Revenge and Streetwise, and you've got a franchise that has managed to sell over 3 million units worldwide. The latest game, Final Fight Streetwise, which was released in 2006 for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox, was met with poor reviews, many criticizing the camera, graphics, and overall lackluster polish of the product. It's hard to say whether this has turned Capcom off the series, but at the moment I believe it's on live support due to the community's efforts, even recently looking to port a definitive version to the Sega Genesis with Final Fight Ultimate. Now Capcom would enter the RPG market with the Breath of Fire series in 1993. The series is notable for its reoccurring characters and somewhat ambiguous continuity across all its games. The games all offer their own self-contained stories but follow the journey of Ryu and Nina, well at least most of them do. These games draw a lot of the aspects from other traditional RPGs of the time, featuring the classic turn-based combat formula, 2D character sprites presented from a top-down perspective. Players would move Ryu around the world map and engage in battles to progress the story. These battles would trigger randomly and would often take place in areas such as dungeons. The franchise has grown to include six mainline games as well as multiple mobile games. Up until 2003, the games had been developed for home consoles such as the SNES and PlayStation, but following the release of Breath of Fire 5 Dragon Court in 2002, Capcom would shift the franchise to release only on mobile devices. A total of five mobile games have been released, with the latest Breath of Fire 6 released in 2016. I'm sure many of you consider this franchise to be dead, and in a sense, if you're ranking it based on the West only, it certainly would, as none of the mobile games have ever escaped Japan. Capcom themselves stated that they have no plans of making a new Breath of Fire game, and that due to the overall niche, it wouldn't make sense to try and push out another title. Chris Svensson would state on message boards that the series was a resting IP, but well, this was back in 2009 and that's over a decade ago now, so I unfortunately believe, at least in the West, that this franchise is dead. Now after witnessing the explosive growth of Street Fighter 2, Capcom thought, damn, well why don't we just make another fighting game? And well, that's just what they did. 
Darkstalkers would make its first appearance in 1994 for arcades under the name Darkstalkers The Night Warriors. While the gameplay might seem familiar to the Street Fighter franchise, the characters certainly were not. Set in a gothic horror sort of universe and sporting anime style art, each character was based on a monster from international folklore. The game would also add new additions in the form of air blocking, crouch walking and chain combos. The first game was a hit in arcades, managing to sell over 24,000 arcade units. The franchise would see a further two sequels in Night Warriors Darkstalkers Revenge in 1995 and Vampire Savior World of Darkness in 1997. And while these games were positively received, they didn't sell as well as Capcom had hoped. The franchise has unfortunately not seen a new mainland game since 1997, but has seen multiple ports and remasters over the years. The most notable of these I feel I should mention is Darkstalkers Resurrection. For years, Yoshinori Ono, the producer of the Street Fighter franchise, would state that Darkstalkers is not dead and urge bands to send in requests should they truly wish for a revival of the series. By March 2011, over 100,000 requests had been sent in, and in response, Darkstalkers Resurrection would be developed and released in 2013 for the PS3 and Xbox 360. The game was a HD remaster of the last two Darkstalkers games, but included online multiplayer among other updates. The game flopped though, the game that was looking to resurrect the franchise only helped put it back into a deep slumber. Throughout the years, the franchise has seen its fair share of representation in other media, through anime, TV shows, comics and manga, which has given it enough life to slot it into the life support tier. Now while the last few franchises haven't exactly fared well, this next franchise would help cement Capcom as a household name within gaming. I'm sure everyone has heard of this series, regardless of whether or not you had the balls to play it when you were younger. Heck, even my mum knows about this. I mean, albeit she recognises the name from the movies, which, uh... But regardless, the Resident Evil franchise has become one of the most recognised, if not the most recognised horror series in the world. First released in 1996 for the PlayStation, the game was actually first inspired by another Capcom game, Sweet Home, which was released for the SNES in 1989. Resident Evil would take elements from Sweet Home and expand on them to create what is now considered a defining period for the survival horror genre. Resident Evil. With the choice of now iconic characters Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine, players were tasked with investigating a series of bizarre murders. Gameplay often involved aspects of exploration, puzzle solving, action and inventory management. By the end of 1997, the game had sold 4 million copies worldwide, making it the highest selling PlayStation game at the time. Since then, the franchise has grown to include 8 mainline games, multiple remakes, countless spin-off games and series. The first of these spin-off series was the Gun Survivor series, first making an appearance in 2000 with the release of Resident Evil Survivor. The game branched out from the usual Resident Evil formula by being the first in the franchise to adopt the first person view. The game would also feature branching paths that allowed the player to determine how the story would unfold. A further three sequels would follow, ending with Resident Evil Dead Aim in 2003. Further expanding on the Resident Evil franchise, we have the Outbreak series, first released in 2003 for the PlayStation 2. The game depicts a series of episodic storylines in a zombie inhabited Raccoon City, and has the player control eight characters, each with their own unique abilities. It would also be the first game in the franchise to feature co-op play and online multiplayer support. The game would receive a sequel just one year later in Japan called Outbreak File 2, which had all the original characters returned with new scenarios available. Now if by 2012 you hadn't shit yourself playing this franchise yet, Capcom wanted to make sure you did when they released the Revelation series. Resident Evil Revelations was released in 2012 and looked to return to the roots of horror initially set up by the series. The game emphasizes survival, evasion, and exploration over fast-paced action by limiting the player's movement speed, ammunition, and health. A sequel would release three years later, in 2015, titled Resident Evil Revelations 2. The gameplay, while similar to its predecessor, would include multiplayer aspects allowing for another player to take control of Moira. Players would need to cooperate to solve certain puzzles and complete actions. This series in particular has gone on to sell over 6 million copies, making it one of Capcom's 30 best-selling series, and this is just a spin-off of the main franchise. Resident Evil has evolved far beyond just a gaming franchise, having made multiple animated films, TV shows, merchandise, novels, and comics. And if that wasn't enough, the franchise has successfully broken into the film industry, having had seven live action films based off it. 
Now, I'm not here to shit on these movies, but they are, well, uh, interesting and fun in more ways than one. But despite the constant roasting of these films, the franchise has managed to gross an incredible 1.2 billion at the box office, making it one of the highest grossing film series based on a video game ever. Alongside this monumental achievement stands another, with Resident Evil not only being Capcom's best-selling franchise, but the best-selling horror game series of all time, with 135 million copies sold. This franchise is easily a Capcom flagship. Now let me ask you guys something. Have you ever wanted to play a Star Wars themed fighting game? Oh. Uh, well what about a good Star Wars fighting game? Now if anyone can do it, it's going to be Capcom. In 1996, Capcom released Star Gladiator Episode 1 Final Crusade for the PlayStation 1 and Arcade. Now instead of the usual 6 button system used in other Capcom based fighters, Star Gladiator utilized a 4 button configuration system, offering a more intuitive and simple control scheme for beginners to get into. Add on unique characters and weapons and sound effects that clearly draw inspiration from Star Wars, it was no wonder that this game would draw attention. And within two years, a sequel would release for arcades, being ported to the Dreamcast in 2000. Unfortunately, that's where the series has been left by Capcom. And while certain characters such as Hayato and June have made future appearances in other fighting games, I think Star Gladiator at this point is a dead franchise. Now, have you ever wondered who would win between Wolverine and Ryu? What about Iron Man vs Mega Man? Now while you may never see these type of fights happen on the big screen, the godfather of fighting games Capcom would make it possible to witness these fights with your own hands. The Marvel vs Capcom franchise spans a total of 8 games, starting with X-Men vs Street Fighter in 1996 until most recently with Marvel vs Capcom Infinite in 2017. The basic gameplay? Wait, did you guys hear that? God, the music in this series is so good, and I'll happily die on that rock. Oh, sorry, where was I? Oh yeah, the basic gameplay is similar to that of most fighting games, specifically the Marvel-based fighting games, X-Men Children of the Atom, and Marvel Super Heroes. What the series did introduce, however, was the use of Tag Team System, that has now become synonymous with the franchise. Players were able to swap between Wolverine and Magneto whenever they wished, with each character having their own separate health bar, which would replenish when they were off screen. This added an element of strategy in prolonging fights to help heal back up. The games were an instant hit, both in arcades and on home consoles, with the franchise as a whole selling over 10 million units. And while the franchise hasn't seen a new release in years, it still remains one of Capcom's mainstays for its sheer draw and appeal. Now following the success of Marvel vs Capcom, Capcom looked to incorporate similar aspects in their next series, which was titled which released the year after in 1997 for arcades. The series is somewhat of a forgotten gem in my opinion, and kind of draws in elements from all of Capcom's previous fighting games. The game which takes place in the same world as the Street Fighter series, imitates Star Gladiator's 4 button setup, all while incorporating two character teams similar to Marvel vs Capcom. The difference this time around however, was the player wouldn't swap in their substitute fighter, but instead build vigor that could be used to launch a team up attack. The game was heavily praised and ended up receiving a sequel called which was released just three years later for arcades, before being ported over to the Dreamcast in 2001. The same fighting system was used from its predecessor, however instead of only two character teams, this game had players build teams of three. This not only meant that a further team up attack could be used, but a new type of attack called a party attack was made available. Players could also cancel out opponents team up attacks by executing one themselves, which added a layer of depth to the already engaging gameplay. While the sequel sold decently well, I guess it wasn't enough as there hasn't been a new game since. In 2013, director Hideaki Itsuno did express an interest in continuing the series by developing a third installment. But seeing as this was a decade ago, I think the Rival School series has to be placed unfortunately in the zombie tier. Now we go from one forgotten gem to another. Capcom really needs to start bringing some of these back honestly. Anyway, the next franchise to be released was Power Stone. Released in arcades in 1999, the game had players select a character before fighting the other characters one by one. These fights would take place in 3D arenas, which allowed players to move freely around and pick up and use objects like chairs, rocks, and even like bombs. Power Stones would appear throughout the fight, and players who collected three of them pretty much went Super Saiyan. The game didn't sell amazingly well, but did end up receiving a sequel a year later called Power Stone 2. Power Stone 2 would feature the original cast along with a few new characters. The game still featured 3D arenas but allowed for up to 4 players to battle simultaneously. The franchise would get its own anime series even that ran through 1999. It was actually pretty good if I don't say so myself. The game would receive a remake for the PSP in 2006 under the name Power Stone Collection. But since then, there's been no real news regarding the franchise since. I did find this Twitter post though. So if you're still waiting on the third installment, best to go and spread the word as they say. 
All in all though, this franchise seems to have been completely forgotten by Capcom, as the characters don't even make appearances like so many others do in Capcom's other big fighting series like Street Fighter or the Capcom vs series. The Power Stone franchise seems to be dead at this point. Now three years after the release of the Resident Evil franchise, Capcom would look to return to the survival horror genre. Now what were the monsters of this game you may ask? Vampires? Maybe they went back to zombies? Well not quite. See this franchise would focus on the reoccurring outbreaks of deadly dinosaurs. Developed by the exact same team behind the Resident Evil series, similarities were immediately obvious in relation to the movement, inventory space, and the tense atmosphere the game created. The franchise would see huge commercial success, with the first game selling over 2.4 million copies on the PS1. This provided a great opportunity, and many saw it as a second coming of the Resident Evil series, uh, just with dinosaurs this time. The franchise would receive a further three games, ending with Dino Crisis 3, which was released in 2003 for the Xbox. Dino Crisis 3 was hit with very mediocre reviews though, with criticism relating to the game's camera, lack of enemy variability, and overall frustrating nature. It probably doesn't come as a surprise then, that the franchise hasn't seen an entry since. As is the case with all these long forgotten franchises, Capcom seems to like teasing the audience with the possibility of a revival. In Dino Crisis' case, the official Twitter account for Capcom's lead development team responded by saying that if enough people wish for it, then a new Dino Crisis title could release. In some regards, this gives enough hope to place the franchise in the zombie tier, no matter how unlikely a true revival is. Wait, do my eyes deceive me? Is that another Capcom vs franchise? Oh, you know what that means. Okay, okay, I promise, that's the last time I'll do that. Probably. But in all seriousness, Capcom would partner with SNK to create another series of games, featuring star characters from both companies like they had done previously with Marvel. The difference this time around though, was that not every game in the series was a hardcore fighting game. In fact, of the 7 games present in the series, just under half of them were actually digital card collection games. Now some consider the card games to be a separate or spin-off series to the fighting games, but honestly it's just easier to talk about them as a collective on the one banner. Released all the way back in 1999, the first game to release was actually Card Fighters Clash, featuring characters from both SNK and Capcom. The gameplay and battles resembled a more simplified version of Magic the Gathering, in which players could place three fighters onto their field to use in battle. A week or so after this release, SNK vs Capcom, the match of the millennium, would release for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. This game lent more into the familiar crossover fighting game that had come before it, and also included a one-on-one -on -one mode, two fighter tag teams like Marvel vs Capcom, as well as three fighter Q teams drawn from SNK's flagship fighting series, The King of Fighters. The series would expand to include a further five games before SNK's bankruptcy, essentially killing off any potential for a revival at this point. The last game of the series was SNK vs Capcom Card Fighters DS, which was released all the way back in 2006. SNK producer Yasuyuki Oda stated in August 2022 that both parties had actually shown interest in a potential revival of the series, so I guess we can push it up to zombie tier. So by now we've covered Resident Evil, we've covered Dino Crisis, well what if I told you that we almost got a ninja version of these games? See back in 1997, Yoshiki Okamoto had the idea to create Sengoku Biohazard, named after the Resident Evil series which was known as, well, Biohazard in Japan. The game was to be set in the Sengoku period, and feature a ninja house similar to the mansion in the first Resident Evil. This ninja house was to be filled with booby traps, with battles taking place using swords and shuriken. The game would go on to adopt a more unique perspective though, focusing more so on the action segments while still incorporating tense horror elements and things like puzzles and fixed camera angles. This game series would go by the name Onimusha. While most of the games in this franchise featured different protagonists, they are for the most part all skilled swordsmen, tasked with slaying enemies and other monstrous enemies. By defeating these enemies, players would absorb Genma souls, which are used to restore health, infuse power into their weapons and armor, and even provide power for the use of elemental attacks. The first game of this franchise, Onimusha Warlords, would release in 2001 for the PS2, where it became an instant hit, smashing records and becoming the first PS2 game to crack 1 billion not 1 billion, 1 million sales. The game would eventually surpass 2 million units sold, putting it roughly in the same place Dino Crisis was in its initial release. Following this success, the franchise would see the release of two direct sequels for the PS2, as well as a further three games afterwards. Originally, Onimusha was planned to be a trilogy, meaning it should have finished following the release of Onimusha 3, Demon Siege in 2004. Well, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately in this case, both Onimusha 2 and 3 sold incredibly well, skyrocketing the franchise towards flagship status at the time. 
Kenji Inafume would state that Onimusha 3 merely ended Nobunaga's storyline, and the next installment would be the start of a new one. Two years passed before Onimusha Dawn of Dreams was released for the PS2 in 2006. Now set decades later in medieval Japan, the story would follow Soki. A new storyline seemingly meant a new experience, as players were now able to control the camera, rather than a static camera employed in the previous entries. In saying this, the game still drew heavy influence from its predecessors, as Soki still possessed Oni powers, and the ability to absorb demon souls upon defeating them. Unlike its predecessors, however, the game would underperform according to Capcom. In terms of sales, the game managed to ship a total of 325,000 units, which for some context was lower than the other three games, but it seems that another franchise has fallen due to lackluster sales. The franchise would see the release of a mobile game, a browser game, before a return to form with the most recent remaster of the original game. Following the disappointing results of the fourth installment, Keiji Inafume would state that while a follow-up to Dawn of Dreams interested him, he was more interested in developing Mega Man Legend 3 at the time. And if we go back to earlier on in this video, we can see... Before being cancelled in late 2011, with no plans to resume development. Well, yeah. That game never came out either, so who knows what the chances of a next mainline game coming out for Onimusha at the moment. In other media though, during 2022, Netflix would announce that the series would be getting an anime adaption. Overall, I think while Onimusha deserves mainstay status, it's hard to place it there currently due to the lack of recent new games. I'm confident that Capcom can at least remaster the final two games of the original trilogy, which could easily skyrocket it back into mainstays and maybe even beyond. Now here's an interesting franchise, certainly not one you'd expect a company like Capcom to publish or push. Everblue would release in 2001 for the PS2 and was essentially a scuba diving exploration game with RPG elements as the player was able to explore sunken ships and learn about marine animal life. The game would feature an inventory system as well as an above water town with shops and even NPCs. Now you may be wondering how this game even ever got a sequel and I'm honestly wondering the same. The game actually received fairly unfavorable reviews but against all odds a follow-up titled Everblue 2 would release just a year later in 2002. The game would, would once again take control of Leo who was the diver in the first game as he and his group of friends found themselves caught in a storm. Their ship would sink as a result, causing them to book it to the nearest island, where they would meet the Amigos. The gameplay for the most part stayed the same as the original. What is especially interesting is that even after this game underperformed, Akira who developed the games would go on to produce the Endless Ocean franchise with Nintendo, which acts as the spiritual successor of the series. In this case though, I think that we can safely say that this Everblue franchise is dead, or maybe even could be considered finished by Capcom. The same can't be said for this next franchise though. Now I might sound like a broken record at this point, but we have once again come across a Resident Evil game. But we're not just talking about any Resident Evil game. No, this time it was actually a failed one. See, after the completion of Resident Evil 2 in 1998, preliminary work began for the future installments into the franchise. This even included a trip to Spain to examine castles as the basis for the environments to be used. The plan was to develop Resident Evil 4 based on this research, with Kamiya looking to incorporate more action features, which Capcom didn't quite agree with at the time, and said it would take away the focus from the survival horror elements and aspects that the franchise was so well known for. What they decided to do was to separate this idea into its own game, and it may have been one of the best decisions Capcom ever made, because not only did we receive arguably the most iconic horror game in Resident Evil 4, but a new masterpiece was born as a result. Alluding to Dante's Divine Comedy, this franchise would go by the name Devil May Cry. The first game of many would release in 2001 for the PS2, where players would assume the role of Dante, fittingly named after the Italian poet Dante Alighieri. The gameplay focused heavily on fast-paced highly stylized combat, where players are ranked based on their performance. This required the player to keep up long attack and evasion strings while avoiding damage. The game would go on to receive critical acclaim for its innovative gameplay, action, visuals, and gothic ambience. Over 3 million copies of the game had been shipped, resulting in multiple sequels being developed. Over the next two decades, Capcom released three direct sequels, with the most recent being Devil May Cry 5 in 2019. During this time, multiple mobile games, a reboot, and various HD collections were also released. The series as a whole has managed to sell over 28 million copies, placing it within Capcom's top five best-selling franchises. The series has found considerable success in other forms of media as well, with multiple light novels, comics, manga, and even a few anime adaptions being made, with the latest actually being produced by Netflix. The franchise is without a doubt a Capcom Objection. Can you can you please wait your turn? Like we'll get to you. So as I was saying, Devil May Cry is without a doubt a Capcom flagship, and it's crazy to think we may have never actually seen its birth in the first place. 
So, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to the next franchise on this list? Well, if you're a fan of legal dramas, then this is the game franchise for you. The Ace Attorney franchise is a series of visual novel adventure video games. The series would see its first entry in 2001 for the Nintendo DS under the name Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney, where it followed rookie defense attorney uh, Phoenix Wright, as well as various other defense attorneys introduced throughout the series. The first game would include five separate cases in which the player was tasked with defending their clients. The games are often broken down into two segments, an investigation section as well as the courtroom trials. Investigations had the player gather information and evidence by talking to other characters and analyzing the environment. This evidence was then used in the trial in which players would cross-examine witnesses and uncover the lies and inconsistencies in their testimonies. The game was praised for its unique gameplay and the sales certainly followed along, with initial sales numbers being far greater than anything Capcom had ever expected. This game in particular has been credited as one of the main influences in popularizing visual novels in the West. Over the next few decades, the franchise has seen the addition of five further mainline sequels, the latest of which being Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney, Spirit of Justice, released for the 3DS in 2016. Alongside these mainline games are two spin-off series, the first of which is the Ace Attorney Investigation series. First released for the Nintendo DS in 2009, the Investigation series consists of two games that unlike the mainline entries followed the prosecutor side, more specifically Miles Edgeworth who's tasked with investigating five cases that tie together to form an overarching story about a smuggling ring. The team wanted to make sure that these games felt as immersive as possible for players, so they allowed players to take direct control of Edgeworth and added the ability to connect his thoughts allowing for new information to be processed. The series has not seen a new entry since Investigations 2, which was released as a Japanese exclusive back in 2011 for the Nintendo DS. Capcom wasn't done with the spin-off series just yet though, and would release the Great Ace Attorney series in 2015. The series would receive two games in Japan between 2015 and 2018, before being released worldwide in a compilation bundle titled The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. The games would follow the ancestor of Riot, a student at Imperial Yume University that holds a strong sense of justice. Overall, the Ace Attorney series has become one of Capcom's most prolific franchises, selling close to 10 million units over its lifespan. The franchise has had multiple stage musicals, live action films, and anime, and multiple manga series developed from it. And with the game's consistent releases and respectable sales, it easily cements itself a high spot on this list. I believe it just falls short of other flagship franchises due to the lower sales and limited reach due to its niche genre, but can quite comfortably sit in the main Objection! Are you done? Now like I was saying, the Ace Attorney franchise can easily sit in the main- All, All right, let me ask you guys something again. What do you think this is? A pilot's cockpit? Maybe a submarine's control panel? Nope. This is in fact the controller used for Steel Battalion, the next franchise in this list. Released in 2002 exclusively for Xbox, the players got to use this controller to control a bipedal heavily armoured mecha. The game was essentially a tech demo and simulation game where you had to start up the operating system as well as handle problems like the machine toppling over or overheating. The game was released in very limited quantities and managed to actually break even according to Atsushi Inaba. Honestly, this has to be one of the most interesting games I've ever seen. Now you may be asking, okay Kai, come on, there's no way this overly complex game ever got a sequel. Well, just two years after the first game, Steel Battalion Line of Contact would release. Not only that, a decade later in 2012, a third installment called Steel Battalion Heavy Armor would release for the Xbox 360. The second installment was generally praised, it even has the same controller as its predecessor. The latest installment though, was anything but praised. You see this third game straight away from the old Joy-Con super complex controller and instead had players use a combination of the Xbox 360 controller and the Kinect motion sensor. Safe to say this game was unplayable due to the inability of the Kinect to accurately read the player's movements. Despite the game having a somewhat recent release, I believe this franchise is most likely dead considering its niche appeal and its disappointing end. With their next franchise, Capcom would return to the side-scrolling beat-em-up style with the release of Beautiful Joe in 2003. The game would incorporate a traditional 2D platform side-scrolling element intermixed with charming 3D cell shading graphics, similar to another GameCube title at the time. The player took control of Joe, an avid movie girl whose girlfriend gets kidnapped. After accepting a special V-Watch from his favourite superhero Captain Blue, Joe could then transform into the titular character, Beautiful Joe. The gameplay itself follows the traditional style of beat-em-ups, with a few extra additions in the form of Joe's beautiful effects. These powers, which consisted of things like slowing down time, speeding Joe up to mark speed, and even zooming in to do more damage, the series garnered critical acclaim and saw relatively low sales. Due to the game's low production budget though, the games were actually deemed commercially successful, and the franchise managed to expand to include four total games, as well as an anime TV series and manga. Joe would later appear in future Marvel vs Capcom games as well, 
And despite it seeming like the series is long dead, series creator Hikideki Kamiya would tell people essentially like, look, just spam Capcom with emails if you want this franchise to return. It's just become a common trend with all these lost franchises. Kamiya would state that he would love to finish the series with the third installment, and even remaster and remake the first game on the Nintendo Switch. The series at the moment seems to be resting on life support for now, but if there's one series that isn't in any need of life support, it's this next one. Despite being one of the newer additions to the Capcom library, this franchise needs no introduction. Monster Hunter has quickly evolved into one of the most successful media franchises ever. Over the course of 19 years, the series has produced a total of 6 mainline games and 12 spin-off games. With each release, the franchise grows, with the most recent entry, Monster Hunter World and Monster Hunter Rise breaking records and selling exceptionally well. Funnily enough, if you were to ask someone a decade or so ago what Monster Hunter was, they'd most likely have no idea what you were smoking, as Capcom had this track record of releasing the games to the West years after they'd already released in Japan. It wasn't until Monster Hunter World in 2018 that the series would release worldwide simultaneously. The core gameplay loop centers around hunting, slaying, and trapping large monsters across a variety of biomes. Players would receive requests from locals that could range from gathering of materials to even hunting specific monsters. Players could use these resources and loot gained from slaying monsters to craft stronger weapons, armor, and other items allowing for stronger monsters to be hunted. Part of the game's success and appeal has to do with the game's multiplayer, which allowed up to 4 players to hunt cooperatively. As of the current day, the franchise has sold over 90 million units worldwide, making it the second best selling Capcom franchise after Resident Evil. Now, among the many spin off games, there was actually a small sub series that has emerged, known as the Monster Hunter Story series. These games actually took a detour from the usual Monster Hunter gameplay, focusing a lot more on RPG elements and story, in which the player takes on the role of riders instead of hunters. Players would steal eggs that they could then hatch into monsties. Players were then able to ride these and use them in the game's turn based battle system. The series would receive a sequel for the Nintendo Switch in 2021, as well as an anime series. Due to the appeal of Monster Hunter and the recent releases, this spin-off series is most likely a mainstay. In addition to the immensely popular games, the franchise has anime adaption, manga series, a book, and both a feature film and animated film that was released on Netflix in 2021. The franchise has quickly grown to be one of Capcom's biggest endeavors and is easily one of Capcom's flagship franchises. Now, Capcom mainly focuses on fighting games, but has definitely shifted into other genres such as action adventure games, survival horror games, and even RPGs. What they hadn't delved into just yet was the female market. But not to worry, because Capcom has that covered with this franchise. Full House Kiss. Released in 2004 for the PS2, the game is created in conjunction with a manga of the same name. The gameplay focuses mainly on housekeeping tasks, and has the player, after coming back home from school each day, complete certain tasks within a certain time limit. I'm unsure how well the game sold, but I'm just going to guess that it was a crazy hit, because the game actually got a sequel in Full House Kiss 2, which would release in 2006. These games were actually never released outside of Japan, meaning that we can add it to the list of dead franchises. Now, I have a confession to make about this next franchise. I actually first found out about it through its anime and not its games. Yeah, yeah, I know, shameful. You're allowed to leave a dislike now. But anyway, Sengoku Basara, I would argue, has become more than just a video game franchise anyway. The franchise would make its first appearance in 2005 as a hack and slash action title for the PS2 titled Sengoku Basara Devil Kings. Originally released only in Japan, when looking to localize the game to the West, Capcom thought it would be a good idea to remove all references to Sengoku and just Japan in general in favor of some generic, bland fantasy story, loosely based on the other hit franchise franchise, Devil May Cry. I'm sure Western audiences appreciated this change, right? Yeah. The game ended up both as a critical and commercial failure, and pretty much put Capcom off from localizing any of their other games until Sengoku Basara Samurai Heroes in 2010. The franchise has seen four mainline entries as well as countless spin-offs and mobile games. In addition to the games, the series has had four anime shows, an anime movie, a live action show, magazine series, a bloody trading card game, and numerous other light novels, mangas, and stage plays. And while the game series has only barely sold 4 million total copies, it easily manages to take a spot in the mainstays category in my opinion. Now Okami would dash onto the scene in 2006 for the PS2. While technically only a one game franchise, it has had both the HD remaster as well as the spiritual successor which was released in 2011 for the DS. Set once again in classical Japan, Okami follows the journey of Amaterasu as they save the land from darkness. The game mixes action, platforming and puzzle game elements, similar in a sense to the Legend of Zelda series. The main story is mostly linear, with the option to engage in numerous side quests and optional activities. Most notably, the game makes use of watercolor style 
and cell shaded environments, giving the look and feel of an animated ink illustration. The game would go on to be praised by critics and also win numerous game awards over multiple conventions. Yet despite this universal praise, the game barely managed to sell, remaining under 600,000 copies by 2009 and was recognized in the 2010 Guinness World Records as the least commercially successful winner of a Game of the Year award. Following this disappointment, Capcom would look to release an HD remaster in 2012 for the PS3 before re-releasing on the next-gen consoles in 2017 and finally the Nintendo Switch in 2018. This remaster would sell 3 million total copies, indicating that interest in the series was still present. In response to Capcom indicating that they were looking to revive some of its dormant properties in 2019, Kamiya alongside Ikumi Nakamura who would work on Okami stated on Twitter that Okami is going to be back. For now though, we'll just have to wait and see if that's truly the case. For now, Okami can be placed in the It Exists tier. Now following the poor sales of Okami, Capcom needed a big hit once again. Now let's see, what worked in the past? Fighting games? Uh, there's been plenty of those though. Maybe another hack and slash and beat or beat em up? Nah, they needed something bigger. Oh. Oh, I guess it's just back to zombies. All jokes aside though, the Dead Rising franchise remains one of the most comical and fun series to date. Capcom took a more lighthearted approach in their depiction of the flesh-eating monsters this time around, with the release of Dead Rising for the Xbox 360 in 2006. The majority of the games follow Frank West while he attempts to uncover the mystery behind the zombie outbreak. Essentially, players had 72 hours to do whatever the hell they wanted. They could use whatever items found around the environment to fight off zombies, which always led to some hilarious instances. A total of 8 different endings were possible, based on conditions met by the player during each playthrough. To this day, the franchise has had four main entries, with the latest, Dead Rising 4 being released for the Xbox One, PS4 and PC in 2016. Multiple remakes, re-release compilations and mobile games have also been developed for the franchise, and we can't forget the three films, Zombrex, Watchtower and Endgame. In total, the game series has sold a whopping 15 million units worldwide, making it Capcom's sixth most successful IP, a truly impressive feat considering it's one of the newest. I'm honestly split on where to place this. I would personally place it in mainstays as I don't believe it's quite on the same level as the other flagships just yet. Let me know where you guys would place it though. Now it seemed that the release of the Xbox 360 lit a fire on the Capcom's ass, as for whatever reason, Capcom seemingly wanted to take advantage of the new hardware by pumping out new IPs. Dead Rising was the first, and now just 6 months later, Capcom would release another series going by the name of Lost Planet. The series would touch down with its first entry, Lost Planet Extreme Condition. The games featured numerous protagonists of the EDN 3, a planet on the brink of an ice age. The games had the players survive in the harsh conditions while fighting off various alien creatures and others planning to colonize the planet. Lost Planet Extreme Condition would go on to sell over 1 million copies, which was once again extraordinary for a new IP of a new console. Capcom seemed to be on fire, and not long after, a further 3 games followed. The franchise continued to prosper with the release of Lost Planet 2 in 2010 for the Xbox 360. The game would sell almost 2 million copies once again, showing the potential of the series as a whole. You have to remember, this was in an era where COD and Halo were also at their prime which makes the game's success that much more impressive. E.X Troopers, a spin-off game released in 2012, and while it introduced new enemies and weapons, the game would suffer from poor sales. The final nail in the coffin, however, was the release of the latest entry. Capcom would outsource the development of Lost Planet 3 to Spark Unlimited, which would eventually release in 2013. The game was met with mixed reception, with criticism being directed towards the repetitive gameplay and lackluster level design. The sales would reflect these thoughts, as the series hit a new low in terms of sales. The series did have a film adaption in the works from 2008 to 2013, but plans slowly faded out of the picture after the studio in charge hit a financial crash. Since then, no other mentions of the franchise have been made, and it seems Capcom has no plans to revive the series anytime soon. I think despite its explosive rise, its fall followed close behind. I think the franchise sits between the dead and zombie tier, but considering the complete silence regarding the series, it's more likely dead. Now let me ask you guys, what do you get when you combine Devil May Cry hack and slash combat with the fantasy elements of say Breath of Fire and the combat and party systems of Monster Hunter? Wait, I just realized I can't actually hear you guys answer. But if you said Dragon's Dogma, then ding ding ding, congrats, you've won. Nothing. Uh, anyway, Dragon's Dogma was released for the PS3 and Xbox 360 in 2012, and would have players completing quests and fighting monsters in real time, with the ultimate goal being to defeat, well, a dragon called Grigori. Set in the grand open world and played from a third person's perspective, the player had the choice of various character classes. One of the most intriguing aspects of this game was the pawn system. The pawn system allowed players to issue commands such as go and help as well as offer information regarding specific enemies. What was even cooler was how these party moments were generated. If you were connected online, two of the NPCs were borrowed avatars of other players. 
And one last core aspect involved was the grab action, which had players clinging to enemies and objects. The game was a breakout success selling over 330,000 units upon its debut. These numbers actually broke the record in Japan for the fastest selling new IP of the 7th console generation. As of 2022, the game has sold a staggering 7.2 million copies by itself, lamenting itself as one of the most successful Capcom franchises, period. Now technically at the time of writing, the series only has one game, along with an enhanced version titled Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. But last year in June, a sequel called Dragon's Dogma 2 was announced. The franchise would also include a free-to-play online game that was released in 2015. Unfortunately, the game was never accessible outside of Japan, and by 2019, the servers were shut down. This wouldn't be enough to deter fans, however, as very recently, there's been a very dedicated group of players that have managed to restore the Japanese MMO and even bring it to the West, where you can download it and play it on private servers. On the other hand, the series would produce its own ONA for Netflix in 2019. This series as well is hard to place. Because the franchise only has one mainline game to its name, I don't believe it can hang with the mainstays. I think it certainly has the potential following the sequel's release, but for now, it strikes me as just existing. Geist Crusher marks the most recent IP Capcom has developed. It was released all the way back in 2013 for the Nintendo 3DS. The franchise has seen two games to its name, with the latest being released in 2014, also for the 3DS. The games were launched as part of a cross-media franchise that includes a manga series as well as an anime series. Due to the games never making it out of Japan, and with Capcom stating that they have no plans on localizing the series, it's safe to say that this is yet another dead franchise. And there you have it, those are my final lists. Capcom initially made a name for itself as the king of fighting games. Since then however, it has shown time and time again that it has more than enough potential to branch out and create something amazing in other genres. Let me know what you guys would change or add, and I would appreciate it if you guys would consider subscribing, as these type of videos take an incredible amount of work. Now if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go sign some petitions and request some revivals. Catch you all in the next one. Ciao.